So I will start sort of meandering through what I think is going on in the sports law world, which is interesting to me or my students or what have you. But you've got to direct me if you want this to be your night and not my night, because I talk about it with my students and with a lot of other people. And as I said, there's lots of interesting topics here. So I thought what I would do um, is just to sort of take you through the curriculum that I teach very quickly and point out either what's interesting about that part of the curriculum or uh, what, what's current and new going on in the world of sports and the law. People sometimes ask me, and I don't know if any of you ever teach a course in entertainment law, but you could ask the same question. People say, well, what sports law? Why do you need it? Why is it on the curriculum? If it's a contract case in the sports world, you apply contract law. A tort case, you apply tort law. Antitrust case, you apply antitrust law. And your course is a complete waste of time. It's just for people who want to sit around and talk about who's going to win the Super Bowl. <laughs> My response, successful or not, is as follows. There are areas of the law which are just like, where sports is just like everything else. An example would be a medical malpractice case. If the Chargers doctor commits malpractice on the Chargers fullback, and you were going to refer that case out on either side, you refer it to a plaintiff's med mal lawyer or a defendant's med mal lawyer. You would not refer it to a sports lawyer. He or she would screw it up to a fare thee well if they didn't happen to also be a malpractice lawyer. It's not a sports case. The rules are straightforward, simple, and apply to all businesses. But sports is a weird business and there are things we don't have any place else. Uh, an example would be, can anybody tell me their view? I hate to t treat you like students, although we have a couple students back there in the corner. Are the Chargers and the uh, Raiders uh, competitors or are they business partners? What do you think? Both. Business both. partners. Both. Business partners. Both. One both, one business partner. Anybody think they're like, pure competitors or mostly competitors? They compete on the field. They compete uh, for hat sales. They compete to hire <coughs> players in free agency market. They compete to hire coaches when coaches are when they're looking for a new coach. But, I mean, both really is the best answer. You could argue about whether it's 60-40 this way or 70-30 that way, but they're both. Okay, what does it matter? It matters because we have this funky little thing called antitrust law. And antitrust law competitors do not go into a room, close the doors, get out the, the coffee or the scotch, and discuss how they can all make more money this year. If competitors do that, they go to jail. If Ford, GM, and Chrysler have a meeting in Detroit and discuss how to make more money next year, Lights out. I mean, it's not a question whether it's a civil case. It really is a question whether it's a criminal case, and it probably is. Uh, the guys in the suits are going to go to jail. But the guys in the suits who own the Chargers and the Raiders and the Packers and the Patriots and the Seahawks have meetings like that all the time. The owners meet. They discuss, essentially, how to make more money. The TV committee meets. They discuss how to make more money. The draft committee meets, they discuss how to make the draft more successful for them and probably less successful for the young men coming out of, coming out of college. So we have a group of competitors who cooperate, one could say if one were to be nastier, collude, conspire, cooperate, work together in order to enhance, the, maxim, maximize their profits. <clears throat> when a case is brought under the antitrust laws against a sports league or the teams in a sports league or some of the players, some of the players in the broad sense, not guys with uniforms, but actors in a sports league. It confuses the heck out of the courts because <coughs> they don't know what to do. You treat them like Ford, GM, and Chrysler, they're going to lose all the cases. You give them a free pass, they're going to collude like crazy and it's not in the public interest to let them collude. I mean, would you let the Yankees and the Mets decide together what the minimum ticket price should be for a baseball game in New York? I don't think so. That's, that's, that's anti-competitive. If the Mets want to sell tickets for five bucks in the bleachers and they think they're going to get some of the families with four or five children who want to go to a cheap game to come to see the Mets instead of the Yankees, more power to them. That's American competition. And you wouldn't permit that. But again, the Yankees and the Mets and the Red Sox and the rest of them are colluding all the time on other things, like how much to pay rookies and how to handle free agents and how to deal with people from Cuba or Japan or whatever. So sports is a strange business, and there's a lot of cases that you read in, in the case books in which the defense essentially is. The charge is you violated the antitrust laws, or the securities laws, or the labor laws, or whatever it is. 
And the defense, with a lot of legal baloney, essentially boils down to sports is different. And what we learn when we, when we, when we do the course in sports law is the sports is different defense sometimes works, sometimes doesn't work, and you have to sort of sort out when it works and when it doesn't work. Labor law is another place where, where sports is kind of weird, but you people may be quite prepared for that if you're entertainment lawyers, because I always tell my students that a union of baseball players is really a different kind of entity, a different shape animal than a union of, for example, school teachers or auto workers. School teachers, auto workers, you know, they, they make money in a relatively narrow range. The senior ones make less than the junior ones. And they make, you know, in layers, they make exactly the same amount of money. You know, junior, you know, physics teacher at, you know, La Jolla High School, we pretty much know what they're going to make, no matter how good they are. They don't get merit pay. They don't get competitive pay. And that would be true with auto workers and a lot of other people. The baseball union, as you know, it's not like that. You know, A-Rod is a member of the union. He makes, I don't know, $16 million a year, $26 million a year. Some rookie who's pretty good makes $500,000 a year. And they're in the same union, and someone is negotiating for a contract. And, of course, with the teacher's union, the contract would tell you what the pay was. Now, I guess you guys would say, well, the Screen Actors Guild is a union. Nobody negotiates for pay of Robert Redford if he's in a movie. He negotiates his own deal. So this, I don't know much about the Screen Actors Guild, but somebody in the room probably can confirm that it's a union. You need to be a member of the union to get a job. There are certain t minimum terms and conditions that are required, but everything else is individually negotiated. A sports union is somewhere in between. Everything else needs to be individually negotiated, but within the confines of a collective bargaining agreement that may limit your negotiations quite a bit. If you are the very best rookie baseball player next year, the very best first year Major League Baseball player, I can pretty much guarantee your salary is going to be about $550,000. And in your second year, it's going to be about $550,000. Your third year, $550,000. Now, if you haven't broken your leg or lost your talent in your fourth year, $7 million, $9 million. Fifth, sixth year, a million more than that each year. Seventh year, 18 million, 20 million. So there's a structure created by the collective bargaining agreement within which negotiations take place, except it happens to be not in the first three years because they've locked in a minimum and everybody gets the minimum for three years. So labor law is kind of strange. Also, it's different than it is in other sports. You, have, you, you negotiate your own contract. You and your agent negotiate your own contract, but the collective bargaining agreement ties your hands. So what, what do we cover in sports law? Well, the first, very, first two weeks we cover something which I think is another thing quite unique to the sports business, which is the concept of a league and a league president or commissioner. Because again, please identify for me another American business that has anything like a league. They got a software league up in Silicon Valley where, you know, Google and, and uh, Apple and and the rest of them sit around and discuss how to do business together. They'd have an antitrust problem. They'd also have a trade secret problem and just a competitive problem. You're going to tell Steve Jobs when he was around that he should sit down with the other guys in Silicon Valley and discuss, you know, new products for next year and new ideas? He'd say, I'm the smartest, I'm the best, my company's the best. I meet with my guys. they say, but we have a league. You have to come to the league meetings. I'd say, no, You've got to follow the league rules. He would say, no. So it's a strange construct because the New York Yankees, no matter how, how many good players they sign and what great coaches they have, what great managers they have, they don't have a product until they have an opponent. You've got to play somebody. Yankees without Red Sox, they don't have a game. You could have exhibitions. It could be like the Ice Capades. You'd need to hire some other flunkies to come and beat up on the way the Harlem Globetrotters used to play the Washington Generals, but that, you're not going to sell very many tickets for that compared to the, what the Yankees sell to play the Red Sox. So you are forced to create you a business entity, you an entrepreneur, and your fellow entrepreneurs are forced to create an umbrella entrepreneurial organization that can in some cases tell you how to run your business. And again, you don't have a commissioner in any other sport. It's kind of a weird, it's a weird idea that uh, Commissioner Adam Silver of the NBA
could uh, suspend Donald Sterling from running his own multi-million dollar business because in a telephone conversation with his lady friend, he made a racist comment. <clears throat> but he not only suspended him from basketball, but he began the process by which the NBA owners, by a supermajority vote, two-thirds, three-quarters, I can't remember exactly, could force Sterling to sell. So again, these are entrepreneurs who have given up a lot of their entrepreneurial rights. In extreme circumstances, you can force <coughs> Sterling to sell, and they did. And you could force, you could have forced Steinbrenner to sell back when he ran the Yankees with an iron fist. You know, he could, Steinbrenner could take on anyone in the baseball world except the commissioner who had certain powers over him and once suspended him, and his fellow owners who could pretty much gang up and tell them, tell them what to do. So we spent a lot of time in the course talking about the powers of a commissioner and being lawyers and law students. Then we go to the next question, which is, Okay, if the commissioner does something you don't like, or your fellow owners do something you don't like, can you take them to court? And what's the guy or gal in the robe going to think when you all show up talking about baseball or football or basketball or NCAA sports? Is he going to think, oh, this is fun, I'm going to stick my nose in here and tell these people how to run Major League Baseball? Or is he going to think, I wouldn't touch this with a 10-foot pole, it's too complicated, I'm not a sports fan, or I think I should defer to the person who's been hired by these entrepreneurs to control them. If the contract says this is within his power, for example, to suspend Sterling for running his team, let him go. Not my job to tell these entrepreneurs they shouldn't have given away that much power. So um, that's an important part of the course is what's a league, what's a commissioner, what can they do to you? And there's, all, there's always cases kicking around on that issue, always a new case. Um, a sub-issue with that this year that's very hot is uh, what I call players behaving badly. We have Ray Rice taking on his, uh, his then-girlfriend, now wife. We have uh, Adrian Peterson allegedly whacking around his kid. Uh, we have the usual performance-enhancing drug issues. And uh, commissioners can, can put you out of business. Adrian Peterson is a very talented running back who makes millions of dollars a year and the commissioner so far has suspended him permanently from his only trade. I don't believe, you know, Peterson is a trained uh, lawyer, doctor, dentist, architect, or anything else. What he knows how to do is play professional football. And um, the commissioner has told him that because he hit his kid with a switch, he couldn't play the rest of this year, and he's not sure when he's going to let him come back. It's an awesome that's an awesome power, since he has no other skills, and he has almost nowhere else to take it. He could go to Canada, but I believe there may be some kind of an operating agreement between the Canadian Football League and the U.S. and the you know National Football League that they don't take each other's <laughs> disciplined or suspended players. So he's pretty much jobless, because one guy in a suit in New York City decided that hitting your kid with a switch is, first of all, wrong. Second of all, a wrong that should disqualify you from playing football for a while. And third, that while is going to be this long, this long, this long, or that long. A lot of people have done some pretty bad stuff and missed two games. And Peterson has missed most of a season and is no promise that he's coming back in September. So uh, it's a strange, it's a very strange business. Um, we teach contract law, and in contract law, again, there may be an overlap with entertainment law because the only thing that's really interesting in contracts in the sports business, it isn't, you know, contracts 101 in first year of law school, is specific performance. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're an employee, again, of Google, and you get tired of working for Google, you go work for Microsoft, Google can't stop you, leaving aside a trade secret issue. They can't enjoin you from going to another job, if you breach a contract, they could sue you for damages, but good luck on how much you're going to get, you know, replace the employee, what's your damages, next to nothing. In baseball, if the Cardinals shortstop decides he's tired of playing in St. Louis and he, he likes to surf, he's going to join the Padres, you know, during his contract, and even in most cases between contracts, he's not going. The Padres won't sign him because they'll be in trouble with with the commissioner. The commissioner won't approve the contract, and then we'll let him on the field. So um, 
the the enforcement of contracts is, is different. Now maybe that's the same. I don't know. In entertainment, if if Seinfeld walked off the walked off the set of the Seinfeld show or tried to move it from one network to another, could uh, could they have gotten an injunction against him breaching his contract or just damages? I, I don't know the answer to that question. Whether they have the same same situation with actors, recording artists, what have you. But we have a lot of specific performance and a lot of people being bound to the contract. In fact, I mean, you can start right from the beginning with the draft. You think about the draft. I think everybody in the room probably knows what a draft is and how it works. They draft the college kids or in some sports the high school kids and the worst team gets the first pick. So next year, you know, the worst football team will get the first choice of players coming out of college. Uh, and it sort of makes sense. Is anybody, you know, when any, when any of you started watching football games when you were eight or 12 or 15 years old, did you think that's un-American, unconstitutional, outrageous, violation of the Sherman Act, anything? Probably not. Most people accept it as normal, but what if they did that at law school? They have a draft, right? You're the, so you're the editor-in-chief of the University of San Diego Law Review, and what you're thinking about is maybe you'll do intellectual property work in the Bay Area, and you get drafted by a litigation firm in Detroit. You're told you, you can go to Detroit or you can find another profession. Outrageous, un-American, unconstitutional, impossible, right? Why, why do the football players get, why do the football teams get to do it and the, uh, and the law firms not get to do it? Anybody have an idea? What would they say? What would the NFL say as to why they, why they need to do that? And if you had too much competitive balance, the sport would get more boring and fewer people would buy tickets and fewer people would watch it on TV. Uh, because what you really want is you want some teams to hate. So you want the Yankees or the Red Sox or the Patriots or the, whoever it is who you don't like. And you want some teams to be bad all the time and hope that someday they'll recover, like the Cubs. And if so you have some good teams and a lot of average teams and some bad teams. That seems to sell more tickets than if you had almost everybody hovering, uh, you know, winning between 45 and 55 percent of their games. I don't know how you test this, but, you know, serious Ph.D. economists who teach at major universities are writing papers, and this is their conclusion, that some competitive balance is good, but too much would be no good. Um, I teach antitrust in the, in the course, and we've talked already about the Chargers and the Raiders and all that stuff. You know, we'll have, we'll have one of those issues coming up soon if... Uh, if the Rams or the Chargers or the Raiders try to move to Los Angeles and the league tells them they can't go, we've already seen that movie once before. That was Al Davis. Al Davis ran the Oakland, the Oakland Raiders. He tried to move to Los Angeles. The league voted against him moving. The league co contract made it quite clear you couldn't move without permission of, again, it was a super majority. Two-thirds or three-quarters of your owners had to approve it. He lost the vote, I believe, 26 to 2, so he didn't get quite close to a supermajority. He got two votes, neither of which was his. He abstained from voting on the basis that it was improper to permit people to vote on whether other entrepreneurs could move their businesses from a city in which they couldn't make a profit to a more attractive city. He thought that was part of his God-given entrepreneurial rights, and uh, a jury agreed and ruled that it was a violation of the antitrust laws for the other owners to get together and tell him he couldn't move. Uh, so people say, well, that means if the Rams or the Chargers or the Raiders try to move to L.A. now, um, they wouldn't be able to do it because, it because the NFL would lose if they tried to block them. And there's two problems with that. One is that the NFL has changed the rule to some degree. I think they've dropped it to a majority vote, which might impress a court or might not. More important, one, what the court criticized them for um, was that there were no standards and no procedures guiding the other owners in deciding whether to let a team move. And now they have pages of standards and procedures. You know, did people come to see the team at the other, other city? Did they try to make a deal with the other city to keep the team there? Blah, 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 blah. So if they followed all the procedures and they got the right vote, and then finally, of course, the Raiders case was decided by a jury. So if you had this, it's viewed as a question of fact, whether the, the restraint of trade was reasonable or unreasonable. So if, the, um, if this case was tried again, it would be tried before another jury. And if any of you do jury work, you know that 
juries are a little unpredictable, and the more difficult and complex you make the issue, I think the more likely it is it's kind of a lottery as to how a jury would come out on a question that difficult. Questions? Mm. Comments? Ideas? I'll keep going. Uh, baseball exemption from the antitrust laws? You can sue football for all the antitrust laws. You can sue basketball, hockey, soccer, lacrosse, tiddlywinks. Can't sue baseball. Because once upon a time, uh, in 1920, uh, somebody sued baseball for violating the antitrust laws, and the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that baseball was not a business. It was just a sport, an amusement, a trifle. And it wasn't really interstate commerce. It was in-state commerce, because each game was only played in one state. And, and the movement between the states was, was um, incidental. Now, this sounds laughable, right? Everybody agree this sounds ridiculous? But if you, if you read the concept of antitrust in 1920, actually it was pretty constrained compared to what it was now, and we were more of a federation of, well, not 50 states, you didn't have 50 states back then, a federation of whatever number of states we had, rather than the kind of confederation we have now, it's all the United States. Uh, so the decision was sort of defensible in 1920, maybe. But the next time the issue came up, the Supreme Court said, well, we've decided this already, and we're not going to change our opinion, and even though that reason wasn't any good, we think stare decisis is a good reason for keeping the rule. So they kept the rule, and they also said, and baseball has relied on this rule in developing its, its reserve system and its draft and its contracts and all the things that it has, so we don't want to pull the rug out from under them. And then it said, People have suggested to Congress that they change this rule by statute many times, and Congress has never acted, so Congress must be happy with it, so we've left it where it is. So it's right where it is, and people keep bringing lawsuits and saying that the rule is archaic and should be overturned, and predictably they keep losing, because if the Supreme Court was not going to toss this rule out in 1976 when Kurt Flood uh, sued Bowie Kuhn, you know, nothing's changed since then. It was an old, archaic, silly rule in 1976, and the Supreme Court said it was just fine. We're keeping it until Congress fixes it. So in 2012 or whenever, when the city of uh, San Jose sued the commissioner of baseball, saying that he was getting in the way of them trying to move the Oakland A's to San Jose, they proudly said they were going to fix this problem and this rule was archaic, and they lost. They didn't get to the Supreme Court. They, they, they could petition for cert, but they'll lose. It'll be cert tonight. The Ninth Circuit dispatched them with uh, with ease because the issue has been resolved.